So first off, I'd like to thank Daniel Payne for his help organizing this session. If you're not familiar with his work, Daniel's a blogger for SemiWiki and his blog posts are always very insightful. So I encourage you to keep an eye out. I'd also like to thank my colleagues, Jan and Jose, for their collaboration, pulling this session together. So Jan and Jose and I have organized this session to have a common introduction. I'll deliver that introduction and I'll set the stage for the motivations for better design methodology. Um, so I'll talk first about RTL uh, design methodology and um, what it lacks. Then I'll talk about high level synthesis for background, uh, of course, being the industry's main push for introducing uh, more productive design practices. And within that context, I'll talk about where the opportunities are. And then I'll present an example that the three of us will all use to illustrate the uh, respective benefits of our own technologies. So why are we talking about these technologies in particular? Uh, well, it's not about the language. We're gonna talk about the language, but the language is enabling methodology. So we're introducing three new methodologies uh, that are methodologies that you probably have not been exposed to yet. Um, and that's the main reason for bringing these three together in particular. There are others, notably Bluespec, Verilog. Um, we have three slots for the presentation. And um, if I had more, I would have uh, reached out to Bluespec as well. Um, so point being, these are not just better RTL languages. These are better than RTL. So Jan will present Clash, Jose Pyrope, and myself, TL Verilog. So uh, let's start with RTL. RTL came into uh, practice around 1985. This was the time of the 386 processor. 386 ran at a clock speed of 33 megahertz. It was fast at the time. Now we're running the clocks at 100 times that frequency. So in a single clock pulse, when RTL was invented, we can do, or came into practice, we can do 100 clock pulses today in the same amount of time. Transistor counts, 275,000 for 386. Today we're you know, around 20 billion. This is an increase of 70,000 times. So if you look at this, the fundamental building block in 1985, if we consider that to be the transistor, roughly speaking, our building block is a 386 processor. Right, we, have, we can fit 70,000 of them on a single die where we could fit 275,000 transistors before. And when you're talking about scaling in that order of magnitude, it's a completely different problem with completely different challenges. RTL was not built to solve these challenges. So RTL methodology, you know, RTL serves as the golden reference model. Uh, you've got various higher level models to verify the RTL and prove that it's correct. And these, uh, these higher level models need to be connected in some way to the RTL. So your verification energy is focused at that particular level of abstraction. And you know, in, in today's terms, RTL is imposing this relatively low level uh, of design. So looking now at high level synthesis. So high level synthesis introduces a modeling uh, based on C at a higher level of abstraction. The C based modeling, you know, roughly expressing the, the model as an algorithm is mapped to RTL by very sophisticated high level synthesis tools. And the designer uh, provides guidance to these tools by specifying constraints and uh, attributes within the, the uh, C-based description. So engineers modeling using high-level synthesis are expressing their model in this uh, C-based representation. The uh, control the designers have is roughly at this level. So their control is through constraints, not through direct specification of what they want. Um, and when I talk with folks who have complaints about high level synthesis, the majority of the complaints, and there's a wide range, but the, the general theme is this detachment between the high level model and the, the register transfer level. So 
when you're not getting the results that you are aiming for from the high level synthesis tools, how do you properly guide those tools? How do you change your model um, to get the results that you want? Um, and you know, understanding how to manage this separation is uh, the source of most, most of these complaints. The industry is taking this concept a step further. Um, a lot of the focus in the industry is toward uh, taking these C-based uh, models <clears throat> and targeting not just different FPGA implementations, but different platforms altogether. So running as software on a CPU or accelerated using a GPU or building for an FPGA implementation or ASIC implementation. So what we have is this sort of John Henry story we have the EDA folks who are saying, we're gonna build these uh, very complex, very powerful, very sophisticated tools that are going to do the bulk of the job for us. And we have the engineers who, in my experience in the industry and as a designer myself, are saying, just give me the, the raw tools, give me the hammer, let me pound my way through this mountain. Um, I can do it faster than the tools which are gonna break down and need maintenance. Um, I know how to do my job. What we need now is something in the middle. We can't afford to be hammering through this mountain with a hammer. Um, spoiler alert, right? John Henry dies at the end of this story. He gets through the mountain first and then dies of exhaustion. We don't want you to die of exhaustion. It's too big a mountain now for us to get through with a hammer. We need tools in the middle, tools that are going to help us as logic designers do the job that we know how to do. Um, humans invent microarchitecture. We're still a long way from machines doing that, but we want tools that are going to help us with the, the, the mechanics of uh, delivering those models and doing so with high le higher levels of abstraction in ways that we can control the design. As in addition to the methodological um, issues with uh, RTL and HLS, the languages themselves carry forward a lot of baggage. So we've got Verilog, which has legacy as a verification language, as its name implies, verification logic. It's a, a, a language for creating event-based simulators that model hardware behavior. It's not a language for expressing hardware. But folks figured out a way to take those higher level models and synthesize them, higher level at the time, and synthesize them into gates. It's for the most part based on sequential semantics, which many people view as a form of abstraction. I argue it's a form of obscurity, not abstraction. Hardware is fundamentally parallel and we should have abstraction mechanisms that are appropriate for hardware. Uh, it's got a lot, especially because of this legacy as an event-based simulator language, it's got a lot of constructs that are not directly relevant for hardware and things that we trip over all the time. Blocking, non-blocking, packed versus unpacked, generate block, sensitivity list, reg versus wire versus logic versus bit, right? None of these directly implies hardware. It's about how we're modeling the behavior. High-level synthesis has legacy as a verification language sounds familiar. And then we figured out ways to synthesize that higher level model into hardware. It has sequential semantics, sounds familiar. It's full of irrelevant constructs because it has roots as a software language. This adds extra challenge for the tools and for the designers. Today, most of the focus with high-level synthesis is um, not just on hardware designers, but software developers um, who want to accelerate the algorithms that they've written in software. And, you know, if you look at the software world, the majority of the software world has moved on from C. The majority of the software world views C as a legacy language. There are still domains where C is relevant in software. Those are mostly domains where C, the benefit of C is the low level control over the software, right? Those are construct, I mean, that level of control is appropriate for the software world, not for a hardware world. So we have a language that's 
completely irrelevant for hardware design and the industry knows it. This is not a mystery to anyone. Um, the reasons are more marketing than they are technical. So what we want here is the best of both, right? We want to benefit from abstraction. We have to benefit from abstraction. We can't afford to be designing at the register transfer level anymore. We can't afford design teams that are you know, hundreds of people working for four years or so to do the next generation iterative piece of silicon. We have to design more abstract. We have to uh, raise the level of verification uh, to eliminate bugs. But it's hardware. It's different from software in that you have to physically implement it, right? You're limited. Your, your clock speed is limited by every path in the design, not by one path. You have to control the design at that level um, when the tools aren't going to automatically get you where you need to be. So we want the abstraction. We want the flexibility, right? We want to be able to design a single um, a single model that gets targeted for different implementations. Uh, and we want control. <clears throat> All right, so with that context, um, as I said, we're all three going to present our respective technologies in the context of a common design. For that design, we've chosen a very simple uh, ring. Uh, so the ring has four ports. The packets that are injected into and out of the ring are single flip packets, so just a, a word of data. Those have an associated destination and uh, an associated valid bit. So there's back pressure from the ring, meaning the, the packets will enter the ring into only available slots. And then they'll travel freely around the ring until they reach their destination and hop off. And again, we're assuming no back pressure uh, at the egress from the ring. All right, so with that, you can jump into the subsequent presentations. Um, if you have one uh, technology in particular that you want to look into, you can look at these subsequent presentations independently, but I do encourage you to view all three. They're all bringing something unique to the table, and uh, I think you'll benefit from the perspective they have to offer.